Everything looks like. Yeah. Yes, we good? Should I start? Okay. I'm too short for this. <laughs> All right, Kyle, can I start? Okay. Um, Dr. Sean is an associate professor of mathematics education in the School of Teacher Education, and he is also associate director of the Florida Center for Research in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics at the Learning System Institute at Florida State University. His research interests include student cognition in mathematics and statistics, the mathematical and statistical education of teachers, educational and psychological measurement, and the evaluation of educational interventions. Dr. Sean received the Mathematics Educator of the Year Award from Florida Association of Mathematics Teachers Educators in 2019 and from the Florida Council of Teachers of Mathematics in 2022. He has pre-registered several studies using Open Science Framework and the Registry for Educational Effectiveness Studies. He shares data and replication code through Open Science Framework and the University Consortium for Policy and Social Research. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Sean to deliver his speech. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. Um, so I, I guess first I want to say, before I get into this, um, uh, as you might guess from that bio, I don't do research in open science. I sort of I try to become a practitioner of open science, but my research area is in, in math and statistics education. Um, uh, and so I'll, and I believe I'm preaching to the choir here, so um, I think I'll, I'll go through a lot of this just really quickly. Um, and basically, this is kind of why I'm interested and attracted to open science. It's sort of, um, that's what I'm going to talk about. So uh, this is more just a rhetorical question. I don't know, uh, I don't know an empirically based answer other than my own experience, but what's the average number of times an author or a group of authors submits a manuscript to a journal for consideration for publication and into the peer review process? Um, and, and, and not necessarily how many times do they revise and resubmit, but how many different journals do they end up having to submit to? I don't know the answer to the question, but in my experience, it probably averages at least three or four. Um, and I think this may, be, this may be different for, maybe I'm not a particularly good writer, but I think one, one of the reasons this happens with my research is I do randomized controlled trials, and that's not typical in my field. And there's a lot of skepticism and sort of uh, fear of that, sort of uh, m mostly skepticism um, in my field that I'm somehow collapsing this complex, uh, really important, complex, multifaceted issue into some sort of single dimension. Um, and so there's a general sense from reviewers who also don't have a lot of knowledge of the methodology and the statistics. Um, so they'll often uh, tell me that blocking is a, t a term that you use in the, in the design of randomized trials sometimes where um, you can sort of, in my case, maybe we'll block on school districts. If we have nine school districts, there's something that each of them have in common with the schools within that district have something in common with each other that the others don't. So maybe we'll say we're going to randomize our schools within districts. So if we have nine school districts, we'll say that district is a block, right? And we want to have roughly equal number of schools within each district in the treatment and the control group, for example. So um, I've had reviewers uh, tell tell me in their review their reasons for rejecting it, you know, I don't know what blocking means, but your description of your randomization procedures are too complicated, uh, and they, they're causing me to believe that um, maybe you didn't actually randomize your sample, right? So, so uh, they're very sure of themselves in their knowledge of statistics and their opinion on, on our methods. Uh, and, and they're flat wrong and even admit they don't know what they're talking about, but that doesn't hold them back from recommending to reject our paper for that reason, 
So that's typical uh, things that, that uh, actually that's not typical, that's one of the most frustrating ones because I still remember it. Um, that, but, but things like that happen a lot, so we have to resubmit. Another problem in my field is the publication pipeline, even when it does go well, that is often like two years or more between when you submit. You, you've already done the work, it takes a while to write it up and, and get it into form to submit to a journal, and then you submit it and it's, it's almost always at least two years before it makes it to print. Um, and if you're, if you're shocked by that, thank you, you should be shocked, but for some reason that's acceptable in our field. So I have a paper that I just asked a colleague about yesterday that we submitted to a journal back in February, early February, um, and you can see in the editorial you know, manager system, management system, where it's at in the pipeline, and it's still waiting to be assigned to a reviewer, so it hasn't been desk rejected, it made it through that first, but it, since February, so we're on six months plus, um, it hasn't even been assigned to go out for review, and the reviewers usually have at least six weeks, sometimes eight weeks to, to review it and turn around, and then usually they'll get bothered for three or four weeks before they actually do it, and so, so it'll, be, it'll be a year before they even make a decision. Right, about about whether they want to just reject it outright or invite us to revise. So um, uh, it's 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 one would think in other fields you might think well send it to you know retract it send it to a different journal. The problem is they all get away with this. So um, so I have lots of grievances about the, about the publication pipeline, um, which is one thing that attracts me to open science and just publishing things like preprints. Um, or working papers or things like that. Um, there are other things. I got this image from the Center for Open Science website of sort of these things in the red font um, in, in, the, in the rectangular boxes are sort of way, th this, this cycle is sort of the, the basic sort of research cycle, right, um, gen generalizable research cycle for, for research, and, and the things in the rectangular boxes are, are sort of places that are threats to the enterprise, is, is how I think of it. Sort of threats to science, sort of um, things that may lead us to have sort of biased views or, or lead to wrong conclusions. So one is lack of replication. We often trust the one study that's ever been done on that topic, and it might we might believe that for years and years before anyone has ever sort of replicated that study or, or looked at it maybe from a slightly different perspective or something like that. Um, that's related to this, on the left, the publication bias. So we all know whether you're officially taught this or not, but reviewers like to see things with low p-values, right? They like to see things that are, quote, statistically significant, um, uh, and they're more likely to reject you know, or recommend not publishing something if you don't have low p-values in your statistical study. Um, so as a result, we have this, this thing called the file drawer problem, where either papers that don't have things with small p-values don't ever get submitted because the, the researchers know that this is, is going to be an uphill battle to get it published. Um, or they get rejected through the, through the review process. So there may be, met, there, we know there are many, many studies out there, um, including some that have done replications, that don't have low p-values, so they've found different results maybe than, than what reviewers would expect to find um, that just never get published. Um, also publication bias, because we know that reviewers like, and editors like small p-values, um, uh, researchers then, and, and researchers are aware of this, whether they're officially taught this or not, um, they end up analyzing their data lots of different ways until they find that statistics, quote, statistically significant result. And then they, pub then they write it up and, and, and share their work at often as though those are the only analyses they did. Um, and so, so th this can be called p-hacking, or p some people call it phishing. Uh, my colleague calls it torturing the data until it confesses, which I think is, is probably the, the most apt metaphor for that. Um, 
But anyhow, so then there's harking. Um, uh, this other stands for hypothesizing after results are known, which again, all, you notice maybe connections between all of these are sort of bad for the enterprise, right? They can lead us to, to conclusions that aren't, aren't generalizable or, or maybe are, are not even correct. Um, and then if you have a lack of replication then, and that paper study does get published, then we can, we can be misled to believe that that's sort of the, the defining result there that, um, that nobody goes back and asks, you know, can we, can we reproduce the, those kinds of findings? Um, so these are all threats to the very enterprise of science and threats to sort of that, that can erode public trust if we're sort of believing things that aren't true or, or aren't uh, replicable or reproducible. So, so um, in comes open science framework and open science in general. These are three badges that are used. You all are probably familiar with this and, and may have seen these. Um, uh, you know, they kind of stand for these three three of these sort of principles um, and approaches to, to um, try to try to move beyond some of these threats to the enterprise of science. Um, the badges are also used, I think, taking a, uh, learning from things like video games where you can earn these sort of tokens and people are motivated by that. So these badges can, can uh, the thinking is maybe they'll motivate um, scholars to uh, to want to do these things so they can have this badge. Um, a quote that I love about this, um, I, I talk about open science with friends, right? And, and friends who are researchers, friends who are not researchers. Um, and particularly, the response I almost always get from friends who are not researchers when I talk about sharing data or pre-registering a study or um, things like that, that, they're shocked and they say, well, isn't that just how science is done? Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I love that response because, you know, I, I like that the general public thinks like, yes, that's what we're doing, but it's, it's not, right? We have a long ways to go to reach that level of sort of results being reproducible, data being shared, our publications being accessible to people who want to read them and can benefit from them and need to know those things. Um, but, but Heidi, Heidi, I think, said this just very simple thing that, that I think is really important open science. It's just good science in the digital era. Now that we can do all these things, share our data, share our, our code, um, publish with open access so you don't have to have a print copy that, that costs a lot of money to print and distribute, uh, we should be doing these things. So what is pre-registration? Um, you all probably know this, but I'll, I'll go through the motions here. This is, this is akin to um, if you play, play billiards, right? Sort of you know that when you're playing that game, uh, there's a difference in rigor and quality if you call the shot the, to get the ball to fall into the pocket versus if you just, you know, hit the balls and some happen to, by chance, fall into the pocket, right? Um, so we know that when we're playing that game and in that setting, or if you're playing horse, right, with basketball, and you're, you know, a lot of times you have to, like, prove the last one uh, to win the game, right? We know that sort of calling your shot ahead of time is more rigorous than sometimes you can get lucky and a broken clock is correct twice a day kind of a thing. Um, so pre-registration involves... Uh, documenting your research plan in advance before you do it and, and particularly before you have the data and have done your analyses. Um, uh, it can be done, pre-registration can be done in, you know, at the moment it's acceptable to do it in fairly general terms or in, in exquisite detail. Um, that seems to be kind of open to the individuals who are, who are trying to get on board with this idea. Um, Pre-registration is happening across the natural sciences um, uh, and, and more so in the social sciences, but I think the social sciences, which is where I'm working, uh, is behind the natural sciences, uh, but hopefully catching up. Uh, why is this important? I think um, one of the reasons why um, some of the folks I know in the social sciences are doing it is it increases the methodological rigor, right? So, so it may protect against things like harking, p-hacking, um, 
public and, and to some extent it may protect against publication bias, but I'm, I'm not sure that may be an empirical question. Um, so when can you do pre-registration? You can do it before you collect. If you're planning to do primary data collection, you can do it before you've gathered any data. Um, uh, or if you're gonna do primary or secondary uh, data analysis, you can do it before you've analyzed data that already exists. Um, uh, you also, another important place where you can do it is, you know, sometimes reviewers ask you to do things and they have a position of power when you've sort of been waiting for all this time and for the review and you get the feedback and they kind of hold the gate to, to you uh, sharing your, your study, the results of it with the world. Um, and sometimes they, they often ask you to do different analyses than you did right, and you described. Um, so, so how does this affect pre-registration? You know, if you agree that those are valid and worthwhile to do, um, then you can go back and revise your pre-registration and the rationale being the reviewer or the editor said I should do these other analyses. I think they're a reasonable request and I'm gonna go ahead and do them, but I wanna preserve my pre-registration by not doing sort of post hoc analyses that I didn't put in my pre-registration. Um, and so you can, you can also update your pre-registration at that time. Um, some registries, uh, um, a very g general one is open science framework. Um, and another one uh, in, in my world is the RIS. It's actually hosted at ICPSR, where um, the previous speaker uh, was talking about. It stands for the Registry of Educational Effectiveness Studies. The general recommendation, sort of following FAIR principles and so forth, are to um, pre-register your study in a, in a registry that's as specific to the domain in which you're working as possible. Right? So, so in biology, for example, there are many, many different registries or, or places where you can share data and so on. Um, in education, there aren't as many. Right? We are, we're still catching up on this idea. Another type of pre-registration in my, in my view uh, that I actually like better, um, I think is a great idea, is this idea of a registered report. Can, can I see, just a show of hands, how many of you all are familiar with this? So, okay, about, about half the room. So this is, a, 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 in my view, a different format of a type of pre-registration. Um, the idea is, you know, if, if these errors are shown, and, and the, the graphic I got again from Center for Open Science website, but if this is sort of the, the flow or the pipeline of publication in a refereed journal, um, uh, you can, uh, you know, you can write up your plan for your research. Um, so kind of the first half of, of a paper you might do, sort of what's motivating your study, why is it important to do, um, what are, the, what are your procedures and methods you're planning to use, including your data analysis and so on. Um, and then you can stop there and submit that for peer review to some journals. So not all journals have this, but, but some do. And in, in my area of education, it's, it tends to be some of the higher quality journals are, are getting on board with this first. Um, but more seem to be getting on board uh, every time I look. But you, you submit that, and then that's called the stage one peer review, and, and the, the, the editors can send that out for review. You can get feedback from reviewers. Uh, I think this is a wonderful thing to do. For those of us old heads, we might not sort of like this, but, but I think our doc students do, because they're, this is basically how a dissertation works in, in my field. You sort of write up your, your research prospectus, you, def you submit that to your committee, they review it, give you feedback, you defend it, and you often revise it. And then, and then they sign off and say, yeah, that's a good plan. That's a worthwhile thing to do. Um, and so, so that's kind of that stage one peer review. And the same, it works the same way at the journal. Um, and then uh, if, if the editor accepts it at that point, it's called a pr in principle acceptance. And, and what that is is basically an agreement between yourself and the journal 
that, the, that if you carry out the plan of, for the research study that you designed in, in the way that you, that you said you would do it, the journal is committing ahead of time before you have the results to publishing you know, the full paper with your results in there. So this is a way, for example, to guard against the sort of p-hacking, publication bias, and so on. So, so it's a way, uh, among many other things, to help make sure that we're publishing results that, that, uh, that we're also publishing results that don't have low p-values and, and maybe don't have results that um, are consistent with what we already believe to be true. Um, so, um, and, and it also, uh, a huge benefit of it for you as, as a researcher is you get free advice from experts in your field before you've done your study. So that can help shape your study, that can help improve your research plan, um, and it may actually, uh, you know, in, uh, it may actually sort of help you uh, to not go down a certain pathway that might have been a real flaw in your design. So there's lots of good reasons to do that. And then if you do, if you do your study, you can, you can write up the, you know, what you did and, and your results and findings and implications and all that kind of good stuff and get a publication out of it. Um, I think this is a great model um, and I think we should probably all be doing this more. Um, what you also can do, oh, I've talked about this I think already, you also can pre-register if you want to kind of do both. Um, you can pre-register the, the stage one plan, right? Because you haven't collected your data yet. You haven't done your data analysis. Um, you, so you can still pre-register it at that point. Um, and actually, if you're going to go the route of a registered report, I would recommend waiting, if you can, on the pre-registration until you've made it through that uh, peer review process. Otherwise, you'll, you'll likely be revising your, your pre-registration. Um, so some of the journals in my field that, that are, use this system of register reports are AERA Open, uh, Assessment, Journal of Educational Psychology, and so forth. Educational Researcher, I just learned this week um, after reviewing for them that, that they're also doing this also. Um, you can find uh, a list um, at the, at the following, at the, uh, uh, web addresses below. Um, open data, another important aspect of open science. Um, uh, sort of why, why do we, you know, by open data, I'm, I'm mostly thinking in terms of sharing the data that you've, that you've produced or that you've used in your research. Um, I think one of the important reasons is, is to amplify the potential impact and legacy of the work that you're doing. Um, there may be methods that exist or, or th that are available 20 years from now that, that aren't available right now um, that can't, you know, and if you, if you don't share your data and make it, make it available to others, um, including yourself 20 years from now, it may just disappear and all that investment of time and, and other resources, expertise. Uh, just just sort of disappears. Um, so that's, a, that's an important reason to do that, I think. Um, uh, probably the worst reason to do it, but still a good reason, is if you're getting funding from the federal government, um, they're, they're requiring it now. So, so that's also then a perfectly valid reason to share your data. Um, and, and some private aid funding agencies are also um, doing this. Another really important reason to share your data is not everyone, you know, if you get, if you get a million dollar grant to, to do some primary data collection and, and to run a study, um, not everyone in the world is, has that opportunity. Um, and uh, so you can sort of create opportunities for, for junior scholars or for others who, who grant writing maybe isn't there particular talent, maybe they're really good at data analysis and asking good questions of data. Um, so it opens the gate uh, to, to doing research, to getting publications, and so on. Um, and that, that's a, a really important reason. You know, we're, we are, are 
are really fortunate here in the U.S. also to have a lot of funding for research, but that's not true everywhere in the world. Um, but, but um, you know, and even for self-serving reasons, uh, if the data are, you know, in my case, they're U.S.-based educational data, um, so if others outside the U.S. are analyzing data, making discoveries from the data, and then making those discoveries available, that's also helping us here, right, um, to learn more about our education system and so on. So um, it's, it's good for everybody. Um, uh, at the same time, um, I, have, I have encountered uh, a general sense uh, that there seems to be, and this seems to be almost nearly ubiquitous belief that secondary data an analysis is somehow lower status than doing the primary data analysis, you know, data collection and analysis. I don't know where this idea comes from. I think it's, I think it's the wrong way of thinking. I know a lot of, a lot of the very top scholars in my field uh, do this regularly. So secondary data analysis of existing data. But this seems to be a very pervasive way of thinking. Um, and in fact, we kind of need people doing data analysis. So my wife works in the environmental science field. Um, and she has talked to me, talked with me a lot about, you know, you can't just like put your cardboard and so on out for recycling without closing the loop by purchasing and using things that were made from that those things that were recycled, right? I think secondary data analysis and publication from that is simil similar in that way of sort of closing the loop and let's keep, let's keep getting more information out of these data and so on because there's, there's, I don't know about you all, but for me there's so many important questions to ask of my data that I will never get to in my lifetime, right? And, and why not put it out there for somebody else um, to do that and give them the opportunity um, to, to have the experience, to get the publications, and for us all to learn from it. So that's my, those are some of my answers to why bother sharing data. Um, so talking about sharing data, what concerns do you have about sharing data? You all are fairly enlightened, I believe, on this. Um, uh, so, but I'll, I'll just sort of jump right into some. There are a lot of really valid and important concerns about data sharing. So if you're working in, in medical research, educational research, there are, there are laws that we must comply with. Um, uh, and so sharing data in ways that would uh, sort of contain personally identifiable information is a, is a no-no, right? Like absolutely can't do that. Um, uh, you know, or or if you if your you know if your IRB says you can't do it, or if you didn't if you didn't think to tell your IRB when you were planning your study that you were going to share the data, um, you need to you need to make sure that you're you're complying with with sort of those ethical and legal obligations. Um, uh, a really big one also is what if there are errors in my data, right? This is a very natural and important question to ask. You should be asking this question anyway, whether you're going to share it or not. Um, but sharing it definitely ramps up the, you know, I can be found out for making mistakes. Um, uh, it, it creates a way for the, the public to, to do. The, um, that's not a good reason to not share your data. It's a good reason to have better data management practices. Um, what I've found in my lab is once we made it clear that our plan is to share the data, everybody tightened up and got better at, at working with data and got more serious about making sure it was correct. So if you're leading, if you're leading a team doing, um, doing research, uh, sharing data can actually make you have better quality data. That's what I think have found to be true. Um, uh, including better quality code, right? We all, ha anyone who's writing code probably has really bad habits of not really explaining or documenting or you have your own little quirks and things. You can get it to work, but another person looking at it will have a really difficult time understanding what they're looking at. Um, so, so yet another reason why, where it's helping. Um, getting scooped is a really important, valid concern in sharing your data. Um, there are ways that you can share your data. You can wait to share your data until you've had a chance to run your studies that you're planning with it. Um, 
uh, and there's lots of methods for that. Um, all that additional work of documenting it, um, again, let, you know, creating a data dictionary that should be absolutely a really well, carefully reviewed data dictionary should be, uh, you know, uh, non-negotiable all the time, even if you're not sharing your data, but if you are, that data dictionary, you know, it helps you all be motivated to do a really good job of that, right? Um, so, so it kind of, uh, and then intellectual property is also a really important concern. Um, if you're gonna be sharing data, you need to, this is yet another thing you need to learn about. Uh, for example, you need to learn about Creative Commons licensing and other sort of intellectual property uh, law and systems that are out there um, and you should be sharing your data in a way where you're very you're very aware of sort of what kind of you know what kind of licensing and, and things that you are sharing that through right? um, uh, so one tool we I've learned this from I learned this from Crystal Lewis who has really helped um, guide my, my team in, uh, you know, the right direction when it comes to data management. Um, since learning about this, I've talked about this with friends. Uh, I have a good friend who got his degree from here uh, at FSU in engineering, and he's the chief of cybersecurity for a data company, a global data company. And um, I mentioned swim lane diagrams, and he said, oh, yeah, you know, this, I thought this is brilliant. My team loves it. Um, and he said, oh, yeah, he knows about this, and, and uh, you know, this is standard. My brother-in-law is, is in the business world, works in logistics, and he knows all about this. I don't know why it took so long for me to learn about it. Um, if you're not aware of it, the idea is sort of this is kind of a, a visual graphic showing kind of the, the workflow that, that a team may use for data management. Um, seems to be very well known in the business world and, and it's something that, uh, that, we, that I just love. Um, so, so it can kind of track the flow of, so each lane in this, if you think of this as a swimming pool with lanes, each lane corresponds to an individual or, or, a, or a team, but in my case I liked it to be an individual's. Um, and it shows kind of wh where they fit in this overall process of sort of what's their role sort of what's their lane that they're responsible for doing and that maybe somebody else doesn't need to worry about doing because um, they, they will be expected to do their job. Um, what I've also found on my team is uh, every individual often works and sort of sees their part of it as sort of so important and they can let it drag on forever and so on and, and, and it really helps us all see how we're all interdependent on each other as we go through here and that we all fit into this big picture somewhere. I think this does better than like a, a linear, you know, uh, sort of workflow diagram. Um, even if it's labeled with names, I think this really helps everybody to see how it works. So um, swim lane diagrams, get to know them if, if, um, if you're working on, on a team. Um, another thing that's, again, just fundamental is a data dictionary. We, this is the term in my lab we use for it. Um, some folks call it a code book. Um, uh, in this case, I'm just thinking of it like literally as a dictionary where it's this rectangular file where I've got the name of a variable and then a, a, a description of it so somebody else can know what that variable represents. Um, uh, you can put other information like the values in your data set um, within that variable. Um, in, in this one, we put, this is something we use, we make a data dictionary before we've de-identified the data. Um, so, so, so for internal use only, this is our data dictionary. Um, and so we put a column as, as we're working with it, you know, does this contain personally identifiable information that we're gonna need to scrub before we make the data available to the public? Um, uh, and that's a tricky one, right? If somebody takes a, takes a survey on their computer, there's probably metadata associated with their responses, like their IP address and the time that they took it. And if, and if their boss knows what computer they were on and, and when they did this survey, right, that could be a way to, uh, you know, for somebody who really wanted to find out 
something about their responses could go back and, and track them down. So um, de-identifying data is another skill all unto itself. Um, but I would say I've, I've used, in fact, I'm guilty even of sharing data publicly uh, where I've done a not very good job of creating something like this. Um, and so this, this is just, you know, it's unacceptable to not do this well, um, but we're all on a trajectory of, of trying to get better and learning to do better. So, um, Fair principles, you all again are probably all aware of this, but um, sort of, I'm probably actually gonna just skip this so that I can stay on time here. Um, so some data repositories, there are many, many out there nowadays. Um, they range from you know, domain general, like Open Science Framework, to ICPSR, which is sort of uh, a little bit less domain general, more in the sort of behavioral and social sciences. Um, and then there are very specific ones. LD Base is a great one um, that, uh, that we can be proud of here at FSU. Um, and there are other repositories, not just for, for data, but also for code and, and so forth. Um, Open materials, that there are open educational resources uh, that, that I think fall under this umbrella. Um, I think of this often in my work as, as measures, so whatever it, whatever it is I use to measure something, um, uh, can I share that? And I, and I try to do that the best I can for sort of full disclosure, enables, enables other researchers or, or consumers of our research to sort of scrutinize exactly what we did and how we did it um, to see, decide whether they agree that what, you know, this thing we're calling it, you know, the way we measured it, do they agree that it's fair to call it that thing, for example? Um, open measures also allows other researchers to use those measures, um, which helps sort of with integrative data analysis or, you know, you don't even need to have advanced techniques for doing that if you're using the same measure. You can maybe compare them directly. Um, that that can help improve how we're doing science. Um, so I've I've de developed a lot of measures in my lab: measures of teacher knowledge, teacher beliefs, teacher math anxiety, um, instructional practice, um, student student um, thinking and and abilities in math, students student attitudes and math anxiety. Um, and to the extent that we can, I try to share those. It took a tremendous amount of resources to create them and refine them and get them to a place where they pass muster. Um, and and now, that, now that we've used them, um, uh, I want to make them available for others to use them. Um, and, and others are using them, and, and I get a lot of joy out of that um, to know that sort of it's not just a dead end and, and that's the end of that work is that others are finding them to be useful. Um, we share, uh, we're sharing code, we're sort of making up a system as we go um, to try to create a model of, of sharing data and code and sort of, uh, you know, our, our, our initial findings from things. We're sharing through Open Science Framework primarily, um, and Gizem is there at the back of the room. She very kindly introduced me. Um, to this, uh, she's been instrumental in doing this. I sh if I had more time, I'd have you give a quick tour, but um, we're, we're, sh we're sharing sort of uh, organizational sort of table of contents, if you will, in there, uh, the data themselves, data dictionary, co the code that we use to analyze the data, some of our output files, um, summaries, sort of things we, that explain what we did, why we did it, and what we found, so on. Um, uh, for each measure and each wave of data collection that we have, we're doing this. Um, if we knew how to use Quart Quarto or R Markdown better, uh, we would be doing that, but we don't yet. So this is our stepping stone. This is our very work intensive way of, of doing what I'm hoping by a year from now, Quarto will do kind of lickety split for us. But, um, uh, but for now, this is, this is how we're doing it. Um, I mentioned uh, intellectual property. Uh, it's important to know about Creative Commons, for example, if you're, if you're sharing things, um, data in particular, but also code and things like that. Um, I'll, I'll skip over this one. Open access publication is a really important aspect of this. Um, there's a lot of ways to, to publish things with open access, like preprints and postprints. Um, 
working papers, research reports. Digital is so wonderful. We use it extensively in my lab. Um, and it ha I'll tell you, well, I'll, I'll get to it in just a moment. But um, uh, there are journals that, that I think are I think fall into this category of sort of hybrid journals where they do some have a paywall where you have to have a subscription and so forth to access things. But as the, as the author, you can also pay a fee a lot of times um, to have what they call gold open access to, to, so, that, so that others around the world can access your work um, with, without having to go through a paywall. I think that's nice. Um, it's not really fair because if you don't have funding to pay that, then you can't publish with open access, but, but I think it's at least a step. Um, there's something that publishers call green open access that I put a question mark on there. I do not think of this, I do not agree that this is open access. Uh, this is basically um, a, a, a publisher, you know, a for-profit publisher usually, um, calling it open access so that it has that label so that it, it, that it be considered to meet some of these federal requirements and so on for open access. But it's not really because um, uh, you still kind of have to know the person. It's basically you can give a copy of your paper to your friends, right? Um, but even if you as the author don't, if your institution or you personally don't have a subscription to that journal, you still can't even go in and get a copy of your own work unless you are somehow can get behind the paywall. Right? Um, so it's not really open access. Um, but it, all it is is the journal agrees that they're not going to go after you if you share a copy with someone you know. But that that's not, doesn't really make it findable by somebody on the other side of the world who, who uh, is interested in reading your research and, and could benefit from it. That's my personal belief on green open access. I, I think it's not really open access. So here are uh, the cover pages of a couple of reports that we in my lab have published through Diginal. Um, the middle one, I uh, just got the news yesterday. It's finally, um, looks like it's gonna get published. It's been a few years now. Um, very happy about that. Um, we, we still have a couple of hurdles in the, in the um, in the review process to get over. But um, the one on the right, uh, we, we had these results in 2018. We thought they were really important. This was a, this was a randomized controlled trial of a teacher professional development program focused on grades third, three, four, and five teachers. Um, and we found that the, the, the program had a positive, uh, statistically significant, and, and probably practically meaningful effect on student uh, understanding of fractions, right, at this grade level. This is a big deal. Fractions are a really difficult, uh, sort of challenging topic for teaching and learning, and really difficult interventions often sort of try to improve the way fractions are taught and learned and fail at that. And this is one that, that we found. Look at this. With a randomized control trial of this program, we found that um, we can move the needle on student understanding of fractions. Um, so we, we quickly wrote up some of our, sort of sketched out what we did and some of our findings, um, put it in here. Uh, that paper is also still in the review pipeline. Um, but uh, this one, we, we then, I, I submitted a proposal to the US Department of Education um, to a program that requires a certain level of evidence to, for programs to be eligible for funding. Um, and it gets reviewed by an organization called the What Works Clearinghouse, uh, the sort of level of evidence. Um, and, and because this paper was out there, that uh, grant proposal, uh, this is what put it over the edge for having at least moderate evidence of effectiveness. Um, and made us eligible, and uh, within a year of publication, we got an uh, almost $10 million grant award from the U.S. Department of Education. And the fact that we could publish this quickly through Diginal is exactly what made that our proposal eligible for funding. Um, very clear line there on sort of how that worked out. Um, and like I said, I mentioned when I started complaining about the long publication pipeline in, in my field, uh, the, the resulting paper, which is so much more involved and, and 
uh, more elaborate and has so much more detail and other analyses like a, like a cost analysis and cost effectiveness analysis uh, uh, is still not published, right, All, five years later. Um, uh, so, the, so the world had a chance to learn about this, had a chance to immediately impact some things that were done um, in Florida in the, in the world of math education, uh, benefit literally thousands of teachers and 100,000 plus students because we were able to publish it quickly. Um, so that's, that's a, a personal story I have of sort of how sort of, uh, you know, it'll be great when this is finally published in a peer-reviewed journal and then we can sort of have that, you know, feather in our cap, if you will. Um, but in the meantime, it already had a really immediate impact, the fact that we published it with open access um, right away through, through our institutional repository. Um, so I'm going to skip some of these. I want to not go any longer. But just in summary, you know, open science, I think, is just good science in the digital era. I love that line. Um, and reproducibility should not become a thing we're all striving for, but a minimum standard uh, in science. Um, so, you know, when you're reading a paper, uh, in the old ways, you know, every word was counted in publication because that paper is expensive and there's only so much space and it can cost them a lot of money to distribute it. We don't really have that problem right now in the modern world. Um, so we might as well share all the detail of what we did in our analyses and, and so forth. Um, uh, I don't know any paper published in a journal that you could, you could definitely confidently take the data, even if you had all the data, confidently analyze it in exactly the way they describe in the journal article, right? There's just not enough room to share all this, that information. But if you share your code uh, and you document it well some, and you share your data, it really could, it can be reproduced. Um, and then others can make some different decisions than you did than you did if they think there's other things to be done and other things to be learned and then they can get another paper out of it. So there's just so many benefits. Um, to do and things like that. So I think I'll stop. Um, but but uh, right after this next two slides, sorry, the um, easy ways to get involved. Publish your preprints, your working papers, your postprints or whatever in an archive or in your institutional repository for us. Digital's fantastic uh, for that. Um, that's easy to do if you if you're publishing a journal article, you've already you've already created it. You might as well just share it through through the repository or, or an archive or something. Um, when you're deciding which journals to submit your, your papers to, um, you know, select ones that are dedicated open access or, have, or at least have a gold open access option. Um, remember, t when you're, if, you, if IRB is a thing that you have to be concerned with in your research, remember when you're writing your IRB application uh, your, that you are to sort of declare that you're planning to share your data at some point um, and, and, you know, have a good plan for doing that in a, in a legal and ethical way. Um, and then consider using the registered report publication process for future studies. I think it's just fantastic. Um, can't say enough good things about it. Um, uh, diff more difficult ways are, is to do a full pre-registration of your next study um, work on improving your data management practices. Um, I know I still have a long way to go on that, but, but we're making progress. Um, and publish the measures that you use, if you possibly can. Publish your replication, you know, your code and output files and so on, not just the stuff that makes it through the filter process and makes it to the final publication. Um, thank you. We're doing questions or moving to or comments. I don't I probably have more questions for you all than you have for me. So. Hello. Thanks so much for your talk. I thought it was uh, excellent. Thanks. So um, you talked a little bit about your frustrations with uh, the long time to publication in 
your field, at least with the, the journals that you publish in. And you also talked about uh, how foreknowledge of data sharing as like an end goal for your, you know, the people, your collaborators, um, has kind of inspired them to develop more sophisticated data management knowledge and practices. This idea of, I'm gonna be sharing this, so maybe I should really make sure that it's, I get it right. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about open peer review in the same, uh, if, if it has the potential to also maybe mitigate some of the time to publication issues and also maybe some concerns about like the consistent uh, quality of peer reviews that we sometimes get from rev reviewers with the same, in the same vein, uh, with the same vi dynamics uh, of this is gonna be publicly available, so I should really um, you know, invest my best effort in it. Can you say what you mean by open peer review? Well, there's, uh, I mean, it can take lots of different forms, uh, so it's a difficult question to answer, but um, the most, I don't know, like fully realized example I can think of uh, is a journal called like F1000 Research, I think it stands for Faculty of a Thousand, and in that case, you have um, essentially like preprints that are posted, and then every single aspect and step of the peer review process is transparent. So there's you know a publicly available web page with the preprint, and then you know um, basically a note and some visual indication that it's been sent out to review to named individuals on on a certain date. So mm -hmm. like the you know anyone can see that like they have agreed to review it. And if there's any kind of delay in them, you know, completing their review, that's visible too. And then eventually when they do, um, you know, complete the first round of reviews, the full text of their comments to the authors is publicly available as well. And you can kind of trace as a reader, um, you know, you can see exactly what was submitted to the journal, the, exactly the comments that came back and all of the different iterations of a review that might follow before the final published version. Yeah. Um, I think it's a really neat idea. Um, in in my field, that's n not ever how it's been done. Right? I think I think in other fields it has. So I don't have firsthand knowledge or, or experience with it. I've, I've observed that this is happening. I've heard that this is happening, but I haven't experienced it myself. Um, uh, I think the the whole peer review process I think is a really really uh, you know can have a I think it's a great innovation. It's a gr um, it can have a positive effect on the quality of research that's published. Um, it's also a very imperfect system, right? And it's a, it's at the end of the day a social system, right? And and a human system. So um, so it's flawed. Um, I think my example of a reviewer who doesn't know anything about the kind of research methods that we're doing and admitted that and yet had no problem then having an opinion on it and recommending reject and accusing us of, of lying and then recommending rejecting a paper. Uh, I think a process like that, uh, that person I think would be rightfully publicly shamed, right? Um, so for sort of speaking on a, on a you know having an opinion on something that you don't know anything about uh, that's that's a that's an unethical practice for from the reviewer perspective in my opinion right if you're reviewing something and you don't know about a topic just don't speak to it like ad actually admit that you don't know right I've done that lots of times like this this aspect of this manuscript I write that to the editor you know I am not an expert on that I I can't speak to it but this other thing. I think I know something about, and, and here's what I think about it. Um, I, I think it, it could, it can, and hopefully does encourage better behavior. Um, I think also there there is a, th this whole idea of a blind blind review where you know, um, in my field, often you s some of the journals still have you sort of you know. Re remove your name as an author from anywhere in the manuscript and write authors comma 2019 or something. Um, if we think this is actually making it difficult for the reviewer to find out who wrote this paper, we're just completely fooling ourselves, right? Especially a, a, a high profile study that's, that's unique and, and, and um, something. So, so uh, one journal that, that, that I have submitted uh, a manuscript to they, they you know 
their policy is you just write it up, you can cite yourself, no problem, there's no masking or blinding needed to be done. Um, and, and, I, and I asked, I wrote the editor and asked to confirm, you know, is this, is this really what we should do? Um, and that editor said, you know, we expect our reviewers to be uh, professional, not try to figure out who, write, who wrote this paper. Um, so that's a different way of doing it. I do think um, there are, you know, there's power dynamics, right? Th this, is, this is sort of, the whole peer review process is about sort of, about power. Um, uh, if the authors, though, are powerful in their field and the reviewer is less powerful and influential, it can potentially, and a reviewer sort of doesn't agree that this is, you know, past muster or, or upholds certain standards, uh, maybe that could create a way where there's some kind of retribution or something like that. Um, so, so I think that's something that is worth thinking about. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for your presentation. There was a lot in there that really resonated, despite the fact that you know we're in pretty pretty different fields. Yeah. Um, with regards to pre-registration, one thing that struck me was the idea that you know rarely at the end of a research project did we really. You know, there was no chance we could have realized that's where we were going to end up. Yeah. So if we're if we want to start pre-registering our studies, the level of detail is going to have to be so general, and then we're going to have to go back and revise the original concept so heavily. Yeah. You know, we might start off like, oh, we want to look at the uh, tissue extract from a particular organism, right? And then you actually do the data collection and analysis and find some result that's really surprising or that you want to dig more into. So you have to go back and do another round of data analysis. So there needs to be a way in the pre-registration concept to continually revise it, update it as the, the, I guess, the overall research project develops and matures. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I think, um, you know, the, this, is, this, this idea this is an innovation that we, we still have a lot of long ways to go to figure out, you know, how can this be done well. Um, I, I have, I've done some where it is just literally drop our grant proposal in there, um, and that was good enough. Um, I've done others where uh, I've been part of uh, with uh, Dr. Colin Ganley, for example. She she really took this to heart and wrote in tremendous detail. I, I, it felt like 50 pages, single spaced. Like, what will we do if we encounter, you know, if we start analyzing our data and we've and we find this, you know, this branching pathways of, well, this, this method of analysis is an option, or if we found this other thing, this other method of analysis. And, it, and it's so much work. And I think that's especially true if, you if you're not doing something you've already done before, right? If it's not a replication study where you've already used these ways of, these methods of measuring things and analyzing the data. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I totally agree. You can revise your pre-registration. Um, in, in the Reese, where, where I have pre-registered pre a study, um, they just track versioning of your pre-registration and you can update it. And so at least the record is there that you had a plan, but then you encountered something, so you changed course ever so slightly and so on. But we have, we have a lot of long ways to work out those details. Yeah, and sometimes projects kind of will, will bud off and become other projects, and there needs to be a way to track all of that, which yeah. I'm, I'm not sure we can do well yeah. right now. Yeah, that's where I really like the registered reports idea. Like, let the, let, I think that's a great use of the peer review process, um, uh, and also provides you with some protection as the, as the researcher, that like, okay, if you've, if you've done, put forth this extra effort up front that's currently not universally expected, you know, you get, you get a, you get some sort of um, agreement that like the payoff will be a little bit quicker review and publication process um, once you've done it. Dr. Shan, I have a question on behalf of one of my friends who is watching from Turkey actually, this YouTube. She is a PhD student in elementary education and she just started her PhD. 
she is asking like what are your some suggestions for early career researchers when it comes to open science like how they can familiarize and she also wonders if it's a good idea to register her dissertation uh, the last question is easy yes uh, you, you've effectively done that al already with you know um, writing up your research prospectus and defending it if that's how you're if that's the method that they use um, um, I think ad advice for for early career is just that like find find data that have been shared in your area of interest um, and and do the analysis and and make some some discoveries and, and findings from that. Um, that idea of sort of close the loop on that, right? Um, I think would be a great way to, to start engaging in the real practice of research and, um, and getting publications and stuff out of it. Um, secondary data analysis is where it's at. Uh, you know, so much effort goes into primary data collection and, and so on. Um, uh, if I were, <laughs> We all make choices in life. If I were to make better choices, I'd probably just become a secondary data analysis <laughs> expert. <laughs> I'd have a lot more time for hobbies. <laughs> Okay, my name is Daljeet and I did my PhD um, analytical studies of artwork of an artist, Son Kadri, who was an immigrant to North America, but emotionally uh, and also tried to understand more depth of the concept of his studies and analysis of uh, his works. I went back to India where he was born so now I'm uh, kind of uh, in a loop. I'm in touch with uh, to get it uh, propo proposal get matured for the publication. So all this process, if I knew, so my thesis are online by the university in India, which is uh, Punjabi University Patiala in Punjab. So my struggle is I was always a North American, but doing it over there now I'm struggling how to find this kind of resources, but. But by coming here, it has been a how to understand the concept. I love the swim lanes that we can think as a project project for myself rather than now I'm swimming from art side due to pandemic to MSIT side. So all these things I'm trying to put together a picture. So thank you so much for everything that I'm learning today. That's my back. Thanks. I do want to, in the, it, uh, that reminded me, I meant to give a shout out to Charity Bunton, who's a doctoral student and colleague of, of mine. She made that particular swim lane diagram. So, uh, anyway. Is that all? Thank you so much, Dr. Sean. For Thank your you. Presentation.